Arratxa Aldeon. Good afternoon. We're going to commence the press conference of the film Double Steps, Los Pasos Dobles. In the official section, we have the director, Isaki La Cuesta. We have the producers, Luisa Matienzo and then Wessler. The scriptwriter, Isa Campo. And we also got the actors, Maquet Barcelo, Alucice, Amodelo and Amasagudelo. And they're ready to answer your questions. So therefore, first questions, please. The first question, please. Raise your hands, please. Okay, well, over here on my right. Hi, good morning. I would like to ask Isaki La Cuesta or Luisa Matienzo, could she explain the genesis of this project? What was the origin? It's quite a cliche question, but I would like to know so that we could um, get deeper meaning upon the, the film. And then Miguel Barceló, what we've just heard, the actor Miguel Barceló, how does a painter like you be introduced as an actor, has a feel, and what made you get involved in a project of this nature? Miguel and I have been giving contrary, contra, contradictory versions upon the origin of the film, so it's better that Luisa says so, gives an answer. The, the story, at least from my point of view, everyone's got the feeling as regards to how it starts, but how we started, I wondered, I felt like uh, shooting a film in Africa, and all of a sudden I thought the opportunity of Barcelo, Miguel Barcelo, to go to go to Dogon to carry out uh, a performance that he wanted to shoot there and to say farewell to all of the people and all of his friends because he wanted to give his last representation in Shanga, in the city where he lives in Mali, uh, for quite a while now. And we decided to go there to record this and we thought, Isaki and myself thought, that we wanted to do something more and we wanted to squeeze a little more juice out of him and not only to record the performance but or shoot the performance but do a parallel approach with the Francois Ogeras, the writer and uh, painter who's more or less his alter ego so to speak and therefore the script writers started to write how we were going to set the story up and then we went to see locations to shoot, and that's how everything started, more or less. In any case, Izaki Barcelo and Barcelo had already met before all of this, of the so-called Genesis Conchita, but they already knew who they were. They met each other, and Barcelo, in his studio in Paris, he has a lot of painting, uh, paintings of Francois, and, and Izaki felt like he wanted to know about who was this absolutely epic and curious character as is France, was Francois and that's where everything emerged from that's how it all started a bit when I said actor I didn't even look when they said Miguel Barcelo because the truth is I avoid albeit uh, I represent a performance there. A at every moment, I carefully tried to avoid acting. It was a bit of... I always did what I would have always done, albeit Izaki hadn't have been shooting in Mali over that period of time. I tried to do what I would have done normally and to use what, we, what happened up in the film, uh, some albino people, scorpions and so forth. That's how I've tried to use, just like Isaki did with myself. I worked as I normally do, as I would do Mali, against the elements and reutilizing uh, the elements, the wind to do something, to use the dust to, to get something positive out of something which is negative and Izaki will work like that I'm not an actor obviously that's quite obvious so from the outset but as Izaki said in these it's all acting in the editing room it's it's like everything is painting for me clay dust or holes and as holes are painting well I'm an actor why not in the same manner 
the strange thing now is that we can talk about both because these are two Ogon, for example, just like Mikkel's paintings and his textbooks when he paints both pages, both paintings, that, but they've changed. The same thing happens with the films. So therefore, we'll try to tell, bear that in mind as well, the other film of the performance that we recorded as well. Hi, good morning. I don't want to be uh, miscourteous, but I'm going to be quite brief. When, I think that when we're discussing a, a festival model, when there's so much creativity that wants to emerge and come to the surface, and there's so many actors... I say actor and not an interpreting actor, but directors and producers that aspire to come to the San Sebastian Film Festival, that you bring two films upon this person who says he's an actor. I'm not going to say anything else. I think it's quite unfair. That's all I want to say. Thank you. We paid for our trip, if, that, uh, if that's some consolation. So it's not being paid by the, by the taxpayer. Yes. Hi, can I hear you? Yes, we can hear him. Hi, good morning. I would like to ask Isaki La Cuesta why is he so concerned by the question of duplicity and the film is called Double Steps we're talking about Miquel Barcelos' text, uh, books, uh, notebooks when he paints. Um, why that double uh, journey of the people and the public and the private figure as well um, and on the other hand, seeing the film, we've got the feeling that something that has evolved during the shoot of the film, that you've um, uh, soaked yourself into what is Mali and your fascination for the country has incorporated new parallel stories to that of the double steps. Yes, the truth is I don't know, because it's true that all the films are de double or turn into something quite strange. What is true, however, when we confront every, any project, we always think there are several possible films, and I'd like to make four or five uh, and and to change the idea of this person, but you can't because of budget uh, and, and obviously common sense. Uh, you can only make one film, which is quite normal. And in this case, we're fortunate enough that Luisa has been just as crazy as us. And all of a sudden, we saw that in the production, uh, both films belong to different types of materials. They said that they couldn't fit into one single one, so therefore we de-doubled them. Uh, we, it, it's called double steps from the beginning when we thought only making one film. So therefore, it, it's as if it was the name was a sort of premonition. And I don't know why this obsession or whatever you want to call it upon double thi two things or double things. It's like changing your style as, as you go. And I think that one changes style as you go. I think it becomes greater. Augusto Monterroso said that there's a, a good conversation changes subject and changes style as it advances. Why not the films? Can, can't they change as it advances? So therefore, this gives us greater strength. That's what we try to do. And about Mali, yes, of course. We started from... We didn't know nothing of anything about Mali. We knew, Mika, we knew about Mikael's paintings. And Ogira's story, which was a sort of a framework, we filled it in with what we found there. I liked it very much when we got to Mali. We saw that... The landscapes had the same cali colors as Mikael's paintings. Uh, I realize it's as natural as thing in the most natural thing in the world. The pigments, uh, the the Ambo is the the, uh, the the assistant of Mikael. Pigments that are made with with the earth there when he paints the the cliff. The cliff is within the painting, so therefore we wanted the film to be the same when we expressed abstract characters. Then you made Masabu, Ajol, and Ambo, for example. You look at the places and you make the film change. So therefore, the original script that we did with Isa, there was a duel between Ojiraz and the hef, the head of the bandit gang, but it turns out that the protagonists were dancers. And Boga is the actor that does Ojiraz, and these two are dancers. And so we turned it into a duel between dancers at that sequence in the discotheque when they're, f they're dancing with uh, Mexilides types of uh, paintings. So therefore, that was the idea. The girl who finds Ojiraz, uh, that love sort of story, was in the script. That was a sequence with Ojiraz. The passage that Jiraz uh, explains in his book, he goes to a brothel looking for a young girl. We wanted a girl who wanted to get undressed in the, and in the audition, this girl was very timid, and it was even better. She, so five or six, we saw five or six girls got undressed. She didn't want to, she didn't want to get undressed, and we, we filmed her shyness there, so therefore, then we transformed things as, a, as, they, as they went on, because otherwise, if you, because otherwise it's like hitting a brick wall if you do the contrary. You've got to let things flow. 
Hi, good afternoon. And this question would be the author, of, uh, well, the, the the soundtrack, he's going to be here. Perhaps he's not arrived yet, but he's supposed to be here. Well, I'll ask you the question, whatever. What drew my attention was the soundtrack, especially two main songs. One, it seemed to me, that has a Western-type air to it, and the other, me, a very similar like... Uh, village uh, festivity type music yes the fact it's the same song with two different versions i think it's something that summarizes the film it's a, a two-step as you rock there's a new uh, the two-step and then put it in through a western which appears in the initial credits and at the end it sounds with the municipal band sort of music and that it it, it goes back to a two-step or a double step as we could call it well did that the music of the damned and he made the the soundtrack which i thought was great i thought many other films would call us up because cinema, spanish cinema as it is they can it can only work with us because nobody's called him and he's done another soundtrack which i love now and gerard sends you 80 or 90 songs that is it for his music we could have made five films with the music he sends you he sends you such an enormous amount i would like to ask the actors from Mali, uh, Amo, Yamasagu, uh, whether they knew about Ojira's story or whether Mikel had told them about them and the, your experience under the direction of Isaki La Cuestia, the experience that you've had of making this film. I didn't know who Ojiraz was beforehand. For me, it was something completely new because I had no idea who Ojiraz was. Nobody knows who he is there. Practically nobody knows Ojiraz. I think we're a small group of about 50 in entire Europe who knows who Francois Ojiraz is. There are about 10 or 15 books a year, the publishing house says, and I think I know everyone who's read about him. Many people think that's me in Venice when we presented it at the pavilion in Venice. And many people thought it was Lo, uh, uh, it was Pessoa. I mean, uh, uh, heterogeneous uh, approach with Ogiras. The truth is, he lived, he suffered, and died in a cave, basically. And he was in Africa, but not in Dogon, but in the Saharian Afra. Africa that I've been to and they didn't know who they were he was but uh, that was the experience in the shoot that's something else yes when we shot the film I knew I knew it through Ojiraz through Izaki's work the truth he said when I started with him and we liked it very much to be able to work with him. My, my name is Alusi Sedizon. I'm a dancer, and it was the first time that I uh, participated in, in a film of this nature. And I met Isaki in Bamako. We did the audition, and... And he said, you've got to be one of the characters in the film, the head of the, the gang of bandits. And, and I adapted with everything that I could contribute to, through dancing. So therefore, it was a, an absolutely new experience to shoot a film in that way. Perhaps what we should say and that Amoya and Masamu are the best friends of Mikel in Mali now for many years. Amo works with him, as I was saying. And the rest of the audition, we were looking for other actors. We went to a Mamako uh, in the uh, cinematography center in Mali. There was an enormous amount of yellow papers with all of the Mali actors. They were dating back to 1979, 1980, where they, 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 they said address, address uh, his house, or call, the ma uh, call his mother to find him. So it was very difficult to find the actor. Imagine a photo from 1982 to find an actor to, in 2011. So it was very difficult. 
we had a director, an, ass- uh, an assistant director that helped us to do this in markets, in theatres and out in the streets. And Ashol and Buba, who's the actor that does plays Ojiras, who couldn't come, they found him in a dance company. And I think that anyone sees the film doesn't that doesn't know this condition. It's quite normal. You think that you've known them for many years. I'm glad how they've all interpreted their roles or played their roles. The Joel and Buba, for example, their physical capacity and the, the for the the dancing scenes and the the fighting in the dancing scene are Masabu, for example, and the Joel and Damon the capacity to narrate because they they're very good storytellers it was the, I didn't understand that they could control the frame so well because they moved uh, very well within each of the different shots and scenes I don't know how they do that because they don't have a visual culture like we do they don't have TV so therefore the shooting of the film was quite surprising I think to a certain extent we've lost spontaneity at that level hi good afternoon two questions for Barcelo the first is like Antonio Lopez with Sol de Membrillo to allow everybody to come into your workshop. Why did you take that step? That's a, why do you allow people to invade your intimacy of the artist, uh, you as an artist? And I didn't know who Francois Auger is. And what happened with those frescoes of that bunker that were painted? Do they exist? It seems not. Well, we don't really know too well. And it's great that such is the case. He describes it in a book which is called Trajectoire, he describes that he painted the frescoes once they were destroyed by Spanish soldiers of the Foreign Legion and he painted them again. And this time he allowed a big rock to fall in so the, to close a small door of the bunker in his book and he says, because my work is not for people of this century. That's his sentence. And in the frescoes of Augeras exaggerates when he says, I've done a great painting, and it might be a, and then it was a, it could have been a small door, that's his nature, and that's the way he is, he might have exaggerated, so therefore in this bunker we've sought after it, through the Augeras and Eradai, and places where it may have existed, I sound, found empty bunkers full, full of serpents and snakes, there were no frescoes, and if there had been a, uh, a fresco, the time would have destroyed it, I'm sure, but that may, may be under the sand somewhere. With Izaki, we thought about uh, uh, make an expedition to find the frescoes, but now it's one of the areas which are danger- the dangerous areas in the country. So therefore, uh, the second question, I was... Sold the membrillo, the experience, and no time that I thought that it was similar, in no time that I thought they'd spend six months in my workshop or one year, quite fortunately. It was quite brief, the period of time. And the truth is, and in that, Izaki adapted himself very easily to my nature. I did what I normally would have done even if they weren't there. And I imposed this as a discipline to myself because I just just didn't want to denaturalize anything at all. The albinos, for example... I'd already thought about painting uh, albinos and it was something theoretical but as it worked so well and it became something which was immediately that formed part of my work and the film itself. While exhibiting myself, well, while exhibiting it was just me working and allow the, there to be a camera there but as I had a good relationship with Isaki, Ian and Luisa and the camera I, it wasn't too difficult for me. It's not. A, there wasn't a lot of camera work. It was quite minimum. My house, everything is open air. Uh, it's a small shelter and a series of caves next to a cliff. In no time did I have the sensation that I had too many people at home. My house is so small, you can, only two or three can fit in a maximum at, at the same time. When we started the film, I believed that someone would make a comparison with Sol de Membrillo and Miquel I was shooting. I was thought shooting in the air with a with a with a shotgun, but and that was it. But there's no doubt in my mind that we weren't going to do that. Hi, good afternoon. I would like to ask you that. That film has very interesting things in it, but it seems to me. And and as you said at the beginning, that you knew nothing about Mali. When the truth, it seems to me that you've inspired yourself upon many moments and some African authors. 
in the Mali cinema can be very interesting as auteur cinema. But then the film falls into something like, it's like a spaghetti western or something of this nature. And at the end, don't you have the impression that at the end it's a film which is quite like a postcard which comes from Mali of different subject matter, Barcelona is talking about, of the albinos they use. But the painting is one thing. Painting, experimental painting is one thing and cinema is something else. And it seems to me that at the end it's a film that me personally didn't move me at all. It's a film that has a lot of things that can be an enormous amount of things but at the end it doesn't give you the impression you know the film by Yossel Yonigitz made in Africa but that film was something else it was a very coherent metaphor which used a certain objective in mind and I don't understand how this film can fit in seeing the other one yes perhaps it's because we never think about using the black people with any objective in mind that perhaps is the principle well, you've got a very strong marked way of making films. African cinema, I don't know it, uh, f unfortunately, not too much. It's quite curious that many people, when they see the film, they think it's very African, and I think it's for something obvious, it's because they're black. It's as simple as that. The way of telling the story, it's the same way of telling the stories of the Ovidio's metaphor, Fersis. We were thinking about legends, of our own, uh, the Thousand and One Nights, for example, the film by Pasolini would have been a film which would have been very Asian well this is a, something that we asked ourselves from the outset the fact that it was a film of white people filming black people and now we, it was all as a group thing and with Lisa and Luisa who, and Amor was guiding us and our other friends there we started from this idea that all of our stories all of a sudden have to fit into theirs I remember for example when and the real story of Ojiras, Ojiras ends his days in a cave like a hermit. And, and then we find that it was like Barcelo, for example. And all of a sudden we saw a, a guy who, uh, and we shot him on a tree. And then all of a sudden we've got a myth which is very similar to this. When we say, well, we're going to do this, that and the other. I, he, that, that skeptic, but believe me, I know you're skeptical in what you're saying. Because you're not saying. I'm sorry we can't hear him now. It's a millinery, uh, a thousand-year-old tradition. I like imperfect films as well. I think they satisfy me. I'm gra uh, it's great that things aren't always perfect and they end up... What was I talking about? Everything fed in, fit in very well, for example. At the end, mythology is all similar. And they had their own stories and their own mythologies, therefore... We've lived very much from what they were telling us and what we saw there. And then people may like it or may not like it. And that's great. That's ideal. I think that's great. And this happens very much. That people appreciate what they've seen that with things that they've never seen at all. And it was good, for example. I think it was great. In the Pasadoble performance, they interpreted uh, based upon their own mythology. And we'd seen in another key, for example, in something different, the performance uh, was more like bullfighting, but it was based upon their own mythology. It's quite beautiful. It's a film that has been made in a union and linking to the people that we met there. Uh, it's not that they were representing for something that was for us that wasn't related to Africa at all. And that's very interesting. And it would be recognized, for example, what we had written down in the script. Two films were made. If you don't like one, look at the other one. Watch the other film. If you, I made two films related to this. One of the two, is, I'm sure, is okay. So check the other film out. And otherwise, we'll promise we'll come back until you like it. We'll come, keep coming. Again. It's like my paintings. I always paint another one because the previous one, I don't think it's very good. And I've been 40 years painting, painting one painting after another because I've never liked the previous one. A question for both of you. A couple of years back, like in 2008, in La Barrica, in London, I th I th uh, it was called two-step or double-step in London. I'm not too sure. You're not an actor. Before you leave, it's easy to link things. If go to Mali and shoot there, if you think. It's not an easy film, if you catch what I'm saying. Sorry, we can't hear him now without a microphone. Okay. <laughs> These guys are worse than criti art critics. Now, I think it's... 
I wanted to answer you. I'm not too sure of whether you want to go now because you might think uh, well, I'm more boring as a person than the film itself. These are you guys are these guys are worse than art critics. And he and he stays. I don't know all the way to the end. He's a bit of. A, I'm sorry, we've interrupted this lady. Uh, well, at least he's seen the whole film. Sorry. I found this work called Two Step or Double Step. It surprised me you're not an actor because you spent a lot of time on stage and quite impressive moments, if I recall. My question is, what relationship exists between that work, Double Step, with with this film because of the title or whether it has something or it has nothing to do with it and why do you have the same actor in the film? You would have to see the other film, Lo de Barro, which is... The basis is the core is the representation of a two-step in the Gogon, the country of Dogon. Aizaki took advantage of this opportunity to make another film about his film, The Double Steps, which has a, an echo of Double Steps. And I appear um, uh, just for a little while, so there are several stories involved. Yes, it stemmed from there, well, perhaps there, and Oji, and Ojiraz, for example. There are a lot of superimposed things, just like my African drawings emerge, that are not very habit-like. That man left, and I didn't want to answer him. We'll send him a letter, I suppose. I don't know. He should send us a letter if he wants to ask a question. Well, have you seen uh, the clay notebook? There's a relationship between these, the previous film. The fiction, one of the initial sequences is the dinner where they're with the map, Sama Masagul looking to find, when they're trying to find the map, the bunker, the, the same film which the, the dinner, the documentary dinner is where Mikkel and Nuts are going to carry out a performance in town and the Masagul is there, he's going to tell us, tell them what the performance is going to look like. What's in the background is a film as a landscape and the other one, they are the protagonists, for example, in the fiction, the albinos that you saw in the documentary film, Miguel Barcelos is painting them with with this bleach and upon uh, with with bleach it starts off with something transparent and it starts a quite the, the bleach starts to emerge as he paints with it so therefore the cave that you saw in the film of the double steps I think these are two films that can be seen separately. You don't have people to know that the other one exists because you'll find the echoes of these. Just to see the clay notebook, in some place in Mali, you know that there's a cave painted by Miquel Barceló, and there'll be tourists that want to go there. And he paints it all, and the, painting is cave, the cave is painted completely, and he goes back and he realizes it's all wiped out. It's, you might think, if you were able to sell the cave, for example, we could have made 200 more films of this nature. I think it's great. I think that he believes everything is a custom, everyone's a habit. It's a habit of mine to go to Africa every year. First of all, I want to congratulate you because the film... I thought it was amazing. I want to see it more times because it has a lot of layers in it and a textual wealth, uh, cinematographically and pictorial and literary at the same time. And amongst all of the reflections that you address in the film is one of the greatest concerns of the history of art. That is to say, the, the why, the reason why why do we create? Because do we create to make it to the audience, to the reader? In the case of the pictorial uh, works that are destroyed or we don't know what's become of them, that also makes us reflect, that Buñuel also reflected upon in his memoirs when he, that he proposed that when he died they should bind, burn all of his negatives, which was never done. Yeah, he wanted to burn, the, we would have to burn the El Prado. Mikel, when he said we should do something, the magma, and the magma could be uh, eaten by the termites. And I continue to believe that it's a good idea. Not to call the real magma. It's just a mock-up of the magma with my exhibition inside it, in which 
And the termites would continue to eat. Well, the idea, it's a bit complicated, but the idea was to paint miniatures of my paintings upon, upon a very fine wheat, uh, okay, miniature paintings upon these little wafers and do a mock-up of my exhibition and allow the termites or little mice to eat them and to film that macro type uh, cameras and it would be a 110 year old painter could tell his story while all his works disappear that was the idea that was the film we were going to make the idea of creating I think at the end of the day it's because of pleasure the most important thing is that almost physical impulse and the feeling that you've done something that you like when one writes a poetry at home a poem at home for example all these I believe in these kinds of things it, maybe someone might read it but I think this is like a second level. Initially, everything was very material, very physical. The pigments, the hands, the bodies. And we can see that the hands at the end are not the idea that many people make. Which is quite normal that they may make them because they only see us in five-star uh, hotels or festivals. But day-to-day -day work is very manual, very technique, technical. Like, for example, there's a person who makes, uh, does the lighting or the sound, for example. It's the same thing. It's a day-to-day -day thing. I think all of this is a film. It's better understood children by children than people that have that are uh, th uh, crit critics or uh, cinema buffs there's too many questions well I'm sure a child will see Son Goku and the character turns up on someone who's jumping around for example it's normally then the more takes you to another story into another story for example and that's the idea all of these series of gaps of the commercial cinema that I like a lot and an and hour and ten minutes we have to resolve it and everything explains everything and it's quite uh, dull and this film we want, didn't want explanations we wanted hard moments on this and the audience could jump from one story to another there's no transitions if we don't expect what exists it exists this has got to do with what Mikkel told us one were the, the termites the idea when there are holes in the middle you can build around it and you don't see it as a problem but as an inspiration and you start to think that that hole that problem and what it inspires. Another one is a phenomenal story that he told us. He, one night on Christmas Eve, I think, I told the story of Christ. I said, What's, who's this Christ? So I started to tell the story of Christ, but at the same night, many stories told. I told the story of Frankenstein and Billy the Kid and Caravaggio, it seems. And after a few days, the story came back to me, mixed up, once again combined. And the Christ was made of uh, skulls, and, and he killed the murderer of his mother, and he ran away. And it was a pope, it was a fantastic story. And that's how images work, and paintings and everything in Africa. My own images come back modified. A good metaphor of this is a sculpture that I made at in the beginning of the 90s it was a monkey skull with wheels mixed with a pumpkin and with a pumpkin shell on wheels and I manufactured I took it and then I made it at large size but then I found that the people in Sabun with monkey skulls made the same object to sell to tourists so therefore my object was modified they didn't know that I'd made it. They didn't care. They made it to make money. And this happens with stories. There are stories that I've told and invented or I've read or I've listened to or I've heard before. It doesn't matter. But they come back uh, polished like a stone that's gone through so many hands, like a coin, for example. And that's very African. There's no TV there. There's no radio. There aren't any newspapers. And there's this coral potential, for example, in the last 20 years of the image and that is to say I show them a stain like I make I say well this is this is a skeleton that's dancing and they say they can see it they can see it as well as I can see it they're much stronger to see sh forms and shapes in stones and rocks so I've been trying to practice for the last 20 years to see shapes in stones and these stories come back transformed and this is one of the points of view of the film. What I must say is I identify myself with this film in the sense that I can assume, undertake all of the shots and they're very similar to the work I carry out. They could be part of 
my iconography, we could say. It's, it's a, collaborate, a collaborative work, but Isaki respected my work as, uh, just like I respected his. And there's more uh, coexistence that, uh, that's going on. Isaki, what anecdote when Mo uh, brought out and uh, shared his customs and habits and mythologies, and having your parents in front of you, what positive things have your parents uh, told you when you told them a story? And for more, Amor, what do you like about San Sebastian and the Spaniards? Amor. Eu te mando esse aqui, te amo de si e de espanhol. O quê? Eu te mando amor. Se que te amo de si, se que te amo de si é de... Se que te amo de si, é de espanhol. Fala espanhol. Então, eu amo muito de lá. Eu gosto de arte muito. Eu gosto de pintar. E a pintura de aqui, de um país. E eu também gosto de assistir os filmes. When we talk about art, I talk about art in the extent, in the ample sense of the word. I also like uh, bullfighting. I like bullfights as well, and the beach. And you're also able to sing flamenco, can't you? You can dance, play, sing some flamenco. Yes, I love it. I, I like flamenco as well. Uh, he, he's, he's listened to Camarón a thousand times. He puts the cassette on and he knows all of the words. And also Tom Waits and Jimi Hendrix so, as well, by the way. And some music by Bach. And as we got to my parents, why can I say they're here in the front row? Somewhere when I was a kid, they this turned me to. They took me to see many films, and then the absurd seventeen-year-old crisis when one doesn't know what to do. I said, "Well, I was I going to become an economist?" I told the, my parents. They said, "But, but you, you think you can be an economist?" I said, "No, they were right. No, no way." And therefore, I redirected my career, and studies. Sorry, we can't hear the question from the floor. <laughs> No sé si se entiende muy bien la pregunta. No estoy seguro de haber entendido tu pregunta bien. Sí, de estas, de estas muchas, por ejemplo. Yes, many of these, I think. Or Giras lived in the caves. In the last few days of his life, he's he lived away a long way from society. When we came to Mali, we discovered that in Dogon. They put the bodies, dead bodies, in the uh, in the in the high walls and the little uh, crevices of the cliffs. These burials I carried out at eight to ten years at the time, so that they can set up the the burial service. So we wanted to do a burial in, in with 50 years preparation, almost in in honor of uh, Francois Augeras. And now we can say that the Osiraz's El tomb, there's one in France and there's one in the, the country of Dogon, which is just as valid as the other one. One thing they do in the funerals is they break the most representative object of the person who they bury. If they bury, for example, a great farmer, they break his whatever it is, or they break the, the instruments of a great musician. When Martel Griol died, who was the first ethnographer who worked there, who uh, told him how to how to, um, he was an anthropologist, so they broke his lip, uh, pencil when he died. In General Luz, they didn't break a camera, but they should have done that. These kinds of things are the, the, is what the, uh, the film deals with. I think we should say the idea is to project both films in Mali, in Bamako and Sangha, where they were filmed, because I remember... In the 1980s, Jean Rouge, who I appreciate as a director, and he also lived in Africa, and I think uh, very close to Ogiraz, he came to project his film upon Sigi of uh, the 1960-odd, I think it was. But Jean Rouge always made films which were whether it was an African or non-African voice, as the guy asked, uh, the person asked earlier on. 
Jean Roos came to project a film for people who 30 years or later so that they could recognize themselves and it was very moving to see the older people who saw they were children in that film 30, in the film Ziggy and we want to do the same thing and not spend so too many years so that we, let's, we, we can do it next year screen them there this is a better question for them Amo and Masabu and it all not too sure whether they're prepared to do so Any further questions? Sorry if I got a bit angry earlier on. I get angry because I like... What happens in cinema is if someone's a vegetarian and says, well, well, I don't like chicken, but people eat chicken, but it's similar. it seems that I'm a vegetarian and they should kill the people that, that, make, that eat chicken. Now, there's got to be chicken and there's got to be vegetarians. There's uh, this latent aggressiveness that has emerged. We don't know where it comes from. Thank you very much for your attention, by the way. Thank you.